welcome. My name is Nick. Like I said, I'm one of the pastors here on staff. If you're watching online, thank you so much for tuning in. We've come to the last week of our Living Vision series. We've been talking about who we are at the crossing, what we're all about, what drives us as a church. Because when we know that, it shapes our future and it points us in the direction that we are going and what we're aiming to do as a church here in Bucks County and in Mercer County. We're, we're inspired by Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18 says this. It says, where there is no revelation, the Hebrew, it, it actually means prophetic vision. Where there's no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. The, the idea of casting off restraint, it means, it means to become unglued, to become unbound. So the idea is, and, and listen, this will preach for your life. It preaches for our church. When there's no vision for the future, things become unglued. In the, in the church world, we can have a lot of great ideas about things that we could do, but when we don't have a vision about who God has called us to be and what he's called us to do, we can go in all different sorts of directions. Same is true for our lives. That's why it's vital for us to continually talk about our vision and about who we are. Our, our vision that we've been laying out, that we've been talking about, that we have printed on these t-shirts that you've seen over the years is this. We are a church that is igniting hearts. Can we all say it together? I think y'all should know it by now. It's up on the screen too. Igniting hearts, changing lives, and impacting the world for Jesus. That's who we are. Are. Now, we've, we, we kind of expand on it a little bit and, and break it down. When it comes to igniting hearts, uh, we believe that we're a place that's called to raise up children, youth, and adults that love God with their whole being, igniting hearts. Everything inside of us is about loving God. Number two, we, we, we believe that we're a place where we, we love God and our lives and relationships reflect the character of Christ. We've spent the last two weeks, we, we broke it down. We talked about inward personal uh, a couple weeks ago. Last week, we talked about the relationships that we have with one another, that we're called to reflect the character of Christ. And then finally, number three, impacting the world. We're, we're called to raise up children, youth, and adults who are empowered by Holy Spirit. Everybody say empowered. empowered. That was weak for a word that's, called, that's empowered. Everybody say empowered. There we go, to fulfill the great commission to the world. Impacting the world is all about being empowered by Holy Spirit and going out to fill the great commission. Now, get this. Y'all ready for this? You and I get to be part of the greatest mission in the history of the world, powered by the greatest power source in the history of mankind. One amen. Good. <laughs> yeah, you're really excited about that. Listen, we get to be part of the greatest mission of the world. Isn't that good? Come on. We get to go out and tell people about Jesus. So today what we're going to do is we're going to break this down. We're going to look at, well, what is this commission thing? What does it look like? How can we be sure of our ability to actually go out and do it? How can we be sure of what we're actually called to do? And what does it mean for us practically, individually, and as a church? How do we actually live that out? Does that sound good today? Okay, four people think it sounds good. Does that sound good? Come on, come on. All right, let me pray and then we'll jump in. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, that you are good. God, we thank you that you've set this, this place, this church up on a hill, Lord that you've set us apart, Lord, to be witnesses, that you've set us apart to be a place of revival, that you've set us apart to be a place of your presence. And Lord, we thank you that you've set us apart to be a place that is called to impact the world, to impact our families, to impact our, neighbor, our neighbors and our, our communities, God. We thank you, Lord, uh, that, that you're calling us to impact the far ends of the earth. And we pray blessing over this time. Speak to us through the power of your word. Be with us. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. amen. One of the greatest elements of our church here at The Crossing is that we are a church that has been living out this vision for decades now. This is a vision that was established decades ago, and we've been living it out. We've been walking it out. We, we do mission trips. We do local outreaches. Let's, let, let's have some fun here. I want you to raise your hand and keep your hand raised if you've done any of the following things. Raise your hand if you've been on a mission trip as part of the crossing. Okay, come on, a little higher, raise them high, good. Raise your hand if you've been part of like a local community outreach or, or something like that here at the crossing. Okay, good, a few more. Raise your hand if you've been involved in any ministry at the church that has had some form of impacting the lives of other people. 
Okay, there we go. That's good. That's good. Look around. I mean, this is who we are as a church. This is what we do as a, a, a church. This church has always been about impacting the world for Jesus, about sharing the gospel, and about raising up disciples. One, one particular example of this that I can remember is back in 2003 when a young lady who was part of this church, she felt a call from God. And she was about to switch her schools for her senior year. So she was about to start a brand new school for her senior year. And prior to the start of the school year, she felt like God was calling her to be a witness in her new school. She felt like God was calling her to witness to her fellow classmates, to tell them about Jesus, and to invite them out to her church and to youth group. So she prayed about it, she talked to her parents about it, she sought counsel from the youth pastor and from the senior pastor here at the church. And before the first day of school, towards the end of the summer, she got her parents and she got her youth pastor and they actually went to the school. And they got into the school and they walked up and down the hallways and they prayed over the school. They prayed prophetically that this young lady would be able to be a light in this school, that this young lady would be able to step into this school and share the gospel and that God's love would go forth in this place. This was a, a young lady that was part of this church that caught the vision of impacting the world for Jesus. And the great news is, nearly 20 years later, not much has changed because now, here in 2022, we are still a place that is empowered by Holy Spirit to fulfill the great commission to the world, and we all get to be a part of it, amen? That's good news. Now, what does that mean? Where does it come from in scripture? Let's explore that. So if you have your Bibles, uh, I wanna encourage you to open up to Matthew chapter 28. It's the last chapter in the book of Matthew. This is the first gospel in the New Testament. So Matthew chapter 28, we are gonna be in verses 16 through 20. And as we come to the end of Matthew, we are in the moments after the resurrection. Jesus was crucified. He rose from the dead. Mary and Peter and John came to the empty tomb, and, and he is not here. He is risen. Jesus has met with his disciples later that Easter Sunday in the upper room, and, and several days have passed now. And we find this last moment in the book of Matthew. Let's read the text and then we'll break it down. Chapter 28, verse 16 says this, then the 11, Judas is no longer with them. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So we have the disciples, all 11 of them, go up to Galilee, most likely it's, it's a week, it's 10 days after the resurrection of Jesus. They're returning home to Galilee because the, the Passover feast is over, so they're returning after their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. We don't know which mountain they go to. It's a random mountain. We can speculate, but we just don't know. And it says uh, in verse 17, when they saw him, they worshiped him. So they, they bowed down before Jesus. I mean, this is the risen Jesus. They bow down before him. They say, wow, Jesus, you are Lord. And, but, but then look at what it says, some doubted. But some doubt it. Now, what does this mean? The same phrasing is, is used in Matthew chapter 14, verse 31, when Jesus calls Peter to walk on water, and Peter actually goes out and he walks on water, but then he sees the wind and the waves, and then he starts to sink. He gets back in the boat. Jesus says, why, why, did, you, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? So what does the word mean? The word could mean that they doubted that this was the real Jesus. They doubted that, wait a second, is he actually risen from the dead? I mean, this guy died on the cross. He was bloody, bruised, and now is he actually risen from the dead? Another meaning could be uh, the, the idea of hesitation, uncertainty. They, they, they worship him, but they're, they're kind of uncertain. Maybe they were, they were hesitant because they're encountering this Jesus and they're wondering, wow, is, is he gonna forgive us? Because think about it for a second. 11, 10, 11 days ago, these disciples all deserted him at the cross. 
You know, Peter, I will never disown you, Lord. Rooster crows, I'm out. They all left him. They all ran away. And, and maybe they're hesitant, you know, they're, they're kind of wondering what type of reception are we going to get from Jesus, from this master that we had deserted. You know, we worshiped him, but we're kind of a little, maybe we're creating some distance because we're kind of we're hesitant about what's going to happen. And listen, I, I believe this is a great encouragement for you and I, because how often do we, because of maybe sin or laziness, get separated from the Lord? And we sit in a place where we say, oh gosh, am I going to be able, is, is the Lord going to receive me back? You know, we, we, we wonder, we question about that. And listen, I'm going to speak to anybody in here who's doubting today. Maybe your relationship with the Lord has been strained a little bit or you've been distant. I just want to speak to you and say that our Lord doesn't look at our doubts. Our Lord doesn't judge us. Our Lord doesn't rebuke us. We're going to see it in the story. But I want to encourage you that our Lord calls us back to him. Here's these disciples who abandon him in the worst possible way. And they're, they're hesitant. But watch, watch, watch what happens. It says, some, some doubted. And he says, then, verse 18, then Jesus came to them. This idea of Jesus coming to them, it's also in Matthew chapter 17 during the transfiguration. The idea is when, when, uh, uh, when somebody comes to you to restore a relationship, Jesus comes to the disciples not to rebuke them, not to say, hey, I can't believe you morons and what you did at the cross. Jesus comes to them to bring them comfort, to restore the relationship, men and women, when we drift from the Lord. He is not out waiting to get us. He's not out waiting to rebuke us and send us to hell. He is waiting and he's coming to us and saying, I love you. I want to restore the relationship. That's who our Jesus is. We see it right here with the disciples. He, he, the, Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is, this is so powerful too because all authority, it, it reminds us of a picture in Daniel you don't, we're not going to have it on the screen, so I'm going to turn there if I can find it. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has a vision of the Son of Man. Chapter 7 verse 14 says this, The Son of Man was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nation, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. The kingdom of Jesus will never be destroyed. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's kind of hard to, 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 to grab a hold of when you're watching CNN and Fox News all day, right? I mean, listen, some of us need to turn off the news and start reading these verses like this, where we see that Jesus is the Lord and Jesus has all authority over the earth. Now, listen, Satan, it looks like Satan is winning right now, but Jesus has all authority. In all time, Jesus has all authority. And that's what he's speaking of right here. He's referencing this. He's saying, all authority has been given to me. As men and women who go out in the name of Christ, we can go out in confidence because we are walking in the authority that's been given to Christ, that's been given to us. Now, in verse 19, he says, therefore, because of the fact that I have all authority, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations. Everybody say all. 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 It's not some nations, it's all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, this idea of make disciples, what's going on here, right? Making disciples, the, 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 the idea, the verb, the word there, it's an imperative command. Jesus is saying, listen, go and do this. This is what I'm, I'm calling you to do. And the idea is not just telling somebody about Jesus, making sure that they say the, the prayer, you know, I believe in Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior. It's, it's, that's good, but it's not just that. Making disciples is 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 the arduous task of lifelong learning and growing with Jesus. Because how often, how many folks in this room, how many, how many of us know somebody who they got saved, maybe it was a big spiritual conference and the, there, was, there, was, there, was, there was hoopla and the spirit was there and it was great and they said, I give my life to the Lord, you know? And then a month later, they're back in their same ways, they're disconnected from God, they, they never really got into the word and they're lost. Jesus is saying, listen, Converts are good. Obviously, this is the beginning, but I want you to go and make disciples. Because a lifelong journey with Jesus is like, it's like running a marathon, 26 miles. And getting saved is like standing on the starting line of the marathon, and the gun goes off, push, and you take the first step. Getting saved is, okay, the journey begins now. It's the greatest journey in the history of the world. 
but it's, it's a journey. It's a lifelong journey with Jesus. He's saying, go, I want you to make disciples. And, and the idea is I want, you to, I want you to help people understand that Christ is the one and only master for them. Help them understand that Christ is the one master, the one Lord. Now, I want to take note here about the way, you know, you, th- you might read this and say, oh, this is a command. We have to go do this, right? The, it's important to avoid any, any duress on this. Go and, and make disciples. The translation is not go, grab people by the arms, twist it, force them to become a follower of Jesus, you know. Ah! <laughs> you know, I mean, how many of us, we know folks that we, we were like, they need to become a Christian and I'm going to make them, you know. And we like have this, like we like just go and like we try to like force them to become a Christian. Like you will go to church with me. I will pick you up, throw you in the car and you will get there, right? You know, listen, it's not a, a force. It's more of a, it's more of a, listen, urge them. Tell them about the goodness of our God. Tell them who Jesus is. Tell them what God has done for us. Urge them to become a disciple. You know, one pastor uh, that, I, that, I, that I listened to, he said, you know, you bring Christ to men. Only God can bring men to Christ. Our, our role, listen, our role is to, is to share Jesus with folks, to bring Jesus to folks, to, to model Jesus to the people around us, to tell them about Jesus. But at the end of the day, we can't control how people respond to the gospel. And I, I want to encourage some of you in here, because I would imagine in a room this size, there's some of you in here who you've been praying for some folks in your life for years, and you've been sharing the gospel with them for years, and you say, man, so-and-so they walked into church and had no Bible background or knowledge, and they, their first church service, they got saved. I've been working on, and working on this person for years, and they're not saved. What's going on? Listen, you keep being faithful. You keep sowing the word. You keep sowing the word. You keep sowing the word. Because we can't control how people respond to the gospel. Jesus is saying, go and make disciples. Urge them to follow after me because of who I am and because of the healing and the hope and the life that I bring. Now, it says, it says, go make disciples of all nations. Jesus breaking down barriers. It's not about being a Jew. It's not about the, just for the Gentiles. It's all nations. Baptizing them. Baptism is the outward sign, the outward expression of our faith. One of my favorite services of the year is when we do our baptism service. And folks come in and they, they get dunked in the tank and they come out and they're washed and they're cleansed, and they're new, and, and, and the church, we, listen, when, when you come to the baptism service, you can't not cheer every single time somebody gets baptized. I mean, it is just an awesome experience where you get, you see somebody get dunked, and the old self is gone, and the new has come, and they're part of our community. They're part of a community of believers. It says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you're into grammar, this is kind of fun because the word name in the Greek is singular. So it's the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Early indications right here of the Trinity. Jesus is speaking about the Trinity, right? We serve one God who's revealed himself in three different ways. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And in verse 20, it says, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Go, baptize, and teach. You know, this scene is very reminiscent of a lot of the Old Testament commissioning scenes. Think of Joshua, think of Isaiah, uh, think of Abraham. When God talks to reluctant people, sometimes sinful people, sometimes folks who have fallen short, And he says, listen, I am going to send you and I want you to go and I'm going to empower you to do this. Men and women, I want to encourage you this morning that God commissions us. Look around the room. Look around the room real quick. Do you see anybody who's perfect in this room? No, nobody's perfect in this room. Sorry to burst your bubble. God commissions us as imperfect people to go out into the world. And he says, listen, I want you to go and I want you to make disciples. I want you to go and I want you to baptize. I want you to go and I want you to teach. Remember the disciples who are hearing this, the 11. I would imagine that many of them were sitting there with some, I mean, we, the scripture tells us they doubted. Wait, is he really calling me? I mean, think of Peter, right? Like, man, I'm the biggest embarrassment in the history of the world so far. I said I would never deny him, and then the rooster crowed, and I denied him. Is is he really calling me? Yes. He called Peter, and he's calling you and I to be his disciples to impact the world. Now, he says, go and teach them to obey. The idea here is, one, all of the things that Jesus taught verbally, but also the way in which he lived his life, the way that he went about 
meeting people's needs, the way that he went about healing folks when, when he met them. And it's not, about, you know, it's not about an academic endeavor. Sometimes we can feel like in the church, like I just gotta get smarter, I just gotta get smarter. Listen, the Pharisees got smarter. They got super smart with a bunch of head knowledge. Listen, a, a disciple of Jesus is someone who comes to him and says, Jesus, you are Lord above all. You're the master, that, that's it. And, and this is huge too, because he says, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. This is huge. Jesus is a barrier breaker. If you didn't know this already, Jesus was a barrier breaker. Jesus was a revolutionary for women in this time, okay? Because education in the first century was typically reserved for, for, for rich, privileged Jewish men. And Jesus is saying, listen, if they come and they follow me, I want you to teach them everything. Jesus broke down barriers from the very beginning. It didn't matter if you were a man or a woman. It didn't matter if you were rich or poor, Jew or Gentile. He says, go to all the nations, all the people. That's the God we serve. He says, teach them all. He's a barrier breaker. I love this. And then uh, in, the, in the last sentence in, in this, if you, have, if you have the good old trusty King James Version, you'll get the full sense of this. There's a, there's a Greek word that's hidden. You don't see it in a lot of the English translations. It says, it's the the idea, before he says the last sentence, it's the idea of, hey, pay attention, take note, pause right here, and I want you to zone in, I want want you to really remember this. And surely I am with you, always, to the very end of the age. Isn't that fitting for the final words of Jesus to remind us that he's going to be with us to the very end of the age? I mean, I love what Donna just said up here, where she said, hey, we're going on Tuesday back to Africa but we're not going alone. Mm. We're not going alone because he's with us. And that's scripture. That's the promise of scripture, right? And, and the, the idea here is to the very end of the age, it's until Jesus comes again, until Jesus comes the second time. And that hasn't happened yet. We're waiting for that. So that makes it obvious for you and I 2,000 years later that this is not only for the original 11 disciples that are listening. This is for all the disciples that have followed after, which means... If you're a follower of Jesus right here, right now, this is for you, and it's for me. It's for all of us. And the book ends here. And I love it because it's almost as if Jesus is inviting us in to the, to the rest of the story. It's almost as if he's saying, hey, listen, Matthew chapter 29, verse 1 begins right now. And you and I are the continuation of Matthew 29. We're the continuation of being a walking representation of Jesus Christ through the past 2,000 years. We get to do it together, together, and we're not alone. And I think, I love the bookends in Matthew. In Matthew chapter 1, it, it, we find that Jesus comes and he's born to the Virgin Mary, and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then look at the very last word the last words of this book, I am with you, always I am with you. I love the way the message translation does this, does this uh, verse. It says, I am with you day after day after day. How powerful is that? That's who our God is. And, and, and he's with us, and, and we've got the greatest power source in the history of the world to help us. You know, a couple weeks ago, my wife and I, we were out with a, a friend, and we were at a park, so we had parked the car, and then we were walking around the park, and we got back to the car, and I went to turn the car on, and I, I turned the key, and it was like, click, 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 click. I was like, no. You know, our friend was like, I think it's the battery. I went to worst case scenarios. I was like, I was thinking, I was thinking it was the starter or the alternator. I'm thinking of the, the hundreds of dollars that we're going to spend, you know, on this. And, and we had no power in the car, and so uh, thankfully somebody came out, and it was definitely the battery. It was like foaming. I was like, yeah, I think it's the battery, right? So, um, so we we fixed, we got a new battery, right? But, but we couldn't start the car because we didn't have the right power source. And oftentimes, we try to do our faith, we try to live out on mission just on our own strength and on our own ability. Like, I got this, I'm going to do this, right? I'm going I'm to handle it, right? If I just get more spiritual, if I just memorize every book of the Bible, if I just have this knowledge, if I just go to this conference, right? And those are good things, but it's not about what we do. It's about the power that God fills us with and the person that he fills us with. Now, I want, I want you to turn, if you have your Bibles, uh, to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, the scripture says this. Jesus is talking to his disciples. This is a little bit later on in the resurrection time before he ascends to heaven. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, 
and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus is telling his disciples that Holy Spirit's gonna come over them. Holy Spirit's gonna fill them with power to, to witness, to evangelize, to preach, and the power is gonna be effective to reach the ends of the earth. Now, we sh I showed you this chart back in May when we did our revival series, and we, we, we talked about Acts chapter one in depth, and we kind of broke it down, and we said the chart is like a geographical region, right? And you say, okay, well, you know, how does, what, how does this apply to us today, right? Nick, we live in Bucks County. We can't, go to, we can't go to Jerusalem tomorrow and then do ministry in Judea, which would be awesome if we could, but, you know, we can't. How does it apply? Like, the, the idea is the geographical regions represent the spheres around us, when Jesus is talking to his disciples, he's saying, hey, you're going to go to Jerusalem first, which is where they were. And then you're going to reach out and go a little bit farther to Judea. And then Samaria, which is outside of Judea. And then you're going to go to the ends of the earth. For the disciples at the time, it was Rome. That was the ends of the earth. And so for you and I, you say, well, okay, well, what does this mean for us? Jerusalem represents those who are closest to us. Some of us in here, we have family members who aren't saved, who are struggling. Maybe God's calling you. Maybe that's your mission field. Maybe that's the, the, the area where you're called to impact the world. For some of you, maybe it's your neighborhood or your community, your sports team. You know, your kids are playing sports. And you listen, you have access to like 20 parents that you could be talking to every practice and every game. Maybe for some of you, it's somewhere in the country where you feel like, hey, I feel like God might be calling me to go here. And for some of you in this room, you are called to go to the far off ends of the earth. You know, I think it's, it's, it's always funny because, you know, we, we talk about this and listen, there are some students in the room here, you know, you're in middle school, high school, and I, we're up here like, go impact the world. And you say, I've got algebra class on Tuesday. Like, how am I supposed to go impact the world? You might be sitting here, you know, you're, you're a businessman, businesswoman. You say, I'd love to impact the world, but I have work on Tuesday. I got to go provide for my family. Listen, it, this is not just about going to a far off place. This is about taking a look at your sphere of influence. Some of us are called to Jerusalem's right around us. Some of us are called to the Judeas. Maybe it's our workplace. Listen, what would it look like for you to start a Bible study at your workplace? What would it look like for you when the coarse joking happens or the inappropriate things start happening at work for you to take a step back and say, listen, I'm not gonna participate in that. And here's why. What would it look like for you to take those, those parents and say, hey, why don't you come over for a barbecue? You know, let's hang out after the sports game. Because listen, it doesn't have to be a grandiose mission trip to the far off places. If you're a student in middle school or high school, you can be a witness to Jesus in your, in your high school. You can walk into the high school and say, hey, I want to model it. Hey, I want to invite kids to church, to youth group. You can model that. Where's your sphere? Where's God calling you to do ministry? Because some of us in this room, a room this size, some of us are going to be called to leave America and go somewhere, which is awesome. Others, we're called to be here. We're called to be with our families. We're called to be with our, in our workplaces, right? But, but the, the imperative nature of Jesus saying, go and make disciples, it requires all of us to be involved. And, and the good news is, in all of the callings, no matter where we're called to, Christ will always be with us. Amen? Now, back in 2003, that young lady that I told you about in the, in the beginning, uh, again, remember, she was transferring schools to start her senior year. So Im imagine that, right? I mean, the, the, the chaos of that, you don't know anybody, right? And so she was pumped for her first, first day of school. You know, uh, just she, she, she's walking in, she doesn't know anybody. She's walking in and she knows that she's got a call from the Lord. She, she feels empowered by Holy Spirit. She feels compelled to fulfill the, the, the great commission. And she walks into this new school with boldness and excitement and courage, ready to do what God has called her to do. And she knew that even in the midst of this daunting task, going and talking to other teenagers about Jesus at a public school, she knew that Christ was going to be with her. How powerful is that? I, I, I wonder how many of us in this room who've gone on a mission trip or who ra you, know, you raised your hand earlier, you, you walked into a, a mission situation, or maybe you just walked into a conversation where you, you, you were saying to yourself, I think I'm going to have an opportunity to impact this person's life. And, and how many of you in those times did you pray, Holy Spirit, fill me up? Fill me up with power. And, and you remember that feeling, that excitement, like, wow, this is going to be so good. Holy Spirit's going to fill me up with power. I'm going to go in and I'm going to do this. I think it's important to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I also think it's important to remember why we do these things. Why are we called to do this? And the number one reason, I want to encourage you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 16 through 20. This is why we do what we do. This is why we impact 
the world. Look, look at what the scripture says. Verse 16, it says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Listen, we could just stop and camp there and preach on that all day, right? Because listen, when you came to know Jesus Christ, the old junk, the old shame, the old guilt, it is gone in the name of Jesus. And you are declared new. You're declared washed. Okay, that wasn't even the sermon. All right, verse 18, and this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Can we say, thank you, Jesus, <laughs> right? Thank you, Jesus. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Everybody say ambassador. ambassador. Say, I am an ambassador. I am an ambassador. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Listen, here's the crash course, right? Sin separated us from God. There was nothing that you and I could do to earn our way into heaven. There's nothing that we could do to earn God's approval, to earn our own salvation. It was because Jesus Christ came to die for our sin, to reconcile us, to bridge the gap. That's who our God is. That's what he's done for us. And because Christ has done it for us, we get this grandiose assignment to help other people walk into it, to help other people step into it. We're ambassadors for Jesus, amen? Now, the word ambassador, it means to function as a representative of a ruling authority. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. Go function as my representative, Listen, when you walk into the business meeting, when you walk into the school, when you go on that mission trip, when you are about to share your faith to somebody, you are a represent, representative of somebody who has ruling authority. That's Jesus Christ. Ruling authority over the demonic powers of this world. Ruling authority over all things. His name is Jesus Christ. You're a representative. You're an ambassador for him. Listen, I don't need to tell you that people in this world are hurting. I don't need to tell you that people in this world are in pain. I don't need to tell you that Satan is wreaking havoc on our culture. He's wreaking havoc on our hearts and our minds. He is, he's loving the isolation that COVID presented where, where churches weren't meeting. He's loving the, 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 the political disruptions and the political arguments. He's loving that we're going at each other's throats. He's loving it. And people need to hear and know about the power and the love of Jesus Christ. They need to know about the life that he brings. They, the world out there, listen, it's lost and it's dying without our Savior Jesus. Men and women, we get to be a part of the greatest mission in the history of the world to bring Christ to men. Amen. Isn't that the greatest mission in the history of the world? I mean, that is, that is, that's who we are. We can bring hope to a hurting world. We can bring light into areas of darkness by stepping into the spheres that God has called us to and saying, hey, Jesus, I'm going to honor you and I'm going to bring you right here, right now. And we all get to do it. We all get to partner together. One of my favorite athletes is a guy by the name of Iliad Kipchoge, and he is a marathon runner from Kenya. And over the past decade, he has won numerous marathons. He's won the London Marathon, the Berlin Marathon. In 2018, he set the world record for a marathon, and he ran it in two hours and one minute and change. Just a little bit faster than my time. And <laughs> why are you laughing? And, and, and so after the 2018 marathon in Berlin, he set out and he said, you know, I want to see if we can push the limits of humanity. And I want to see if I can break two hours in a marathon and run two hours in a marathon. And so he set out in the fall of 2019 in Vienna to run a, a sub two hour marathon. And this is the shot at the finish line when he finishes the sub two hour marathon. You can see the clock on the screen, it says 159.40ish, right? I mean, so, so just for context, this is a, uh, a four minute and 30 second mile time. Has anybody in the room ever run a five minute mile? Anybody in the glory days? We got one over here. All right. Uh, can you prove it out there right now? A couple laps around the church. No, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. All right. Uh, I've never come close to this. I mean, this is not just like a four minute and 30 second mile one time. This is 26 times 
point two, you know, no breaks, right? You know, I was there that day, just a little farther behind him, you know, just to cheer him on, you know, <laughs> like you got, I didn't want to take his glory, you know, you know, average pastor steals spotlight from marathon runner. No, you know, uh, I, I just, I, I decided not to. But what I love about this picture is you see him at the finish line and you think, wow, look at what he did. But if you start to dig a little bit deeper, what you're going to find is that you don't see all of the teamwork necessary to make this happen. Now, I want you to squint a little bit. Behind Iliad is a group of men in black tank tops. Y'all see them? Okay, those were his pacers, okay? He had about 20 of them throughout the course of the race that rotated every four or five miles. And what they would do is they would run with him. They would kind of create like a, a flying V, you know, flying V around him. One for wind resistance, and two so that he could know that, okay, I'm running a four minute, 30 second mile. And then they would rotate every four miles because as great of athletes that they are, they couldn't keep up with that pace. So he had about 20 of those. If you watch the video of the day that this happened, he had multiple dudes riding on bikes. Some of the guys on bikes had laptop screens on their bikes. They're like riding along like, doo -doo -doo -doo, you know, and they're like calculating his timing. They're calculating the weather and the humidity to know how much nutrition he needs. Other guys on the bike had all the, uh, the, the, the water bottles. So at every few miles, they could give him the water bottles with the uh, correct electrolytes and the carbs that he needed. There were other folks that weren't even on the camera, the dietitians, the nutritionists, the physiotherapists who were there, not just that day, but the weeks and the months leading up. And what you realize is this one man to run this sub two hour marathon, it took an entire team of people. And one of my favorite quotes from Kipchoge is this. He says, 100% of me is nothing compared to 1% of the whole team. 100% of me is nothing compared to 1% of the whole team. Men and women, look, look. We get to be a part of the greatest team in the history of the world. And it's not about just one of us, one of me. It's about all of us together. Because 100% of me or 100% of you is nothing compared to 1% of all of us together on fire to impact the world. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 4, he says, Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully, joyfully. Listen, every single person in this room has a select gift, a gift set. If you don't know what your gifts are, come talk to me afterwards. I'll get you a, a link to a test that you can find out what your gifts are. We all have different gifts that can impact the world for Jesus. And God doesn't need just me or just you. He needs all of us working together because we're a church that God has called to ignite hearts, change lives, and we're a church where he wants to use all of us to impact the world for Jesus. We get to use our gifts to bring Jesus to the families around us. We get to use our gifts to bring Jesus to the neighborhoods around us, to the schools and the communities. And we get to use our gifts to go out to the far off places of the world. Church family, what an honor it is to be a part of that. that that's who we are. That's who we are at, at the crossing. You know, that, that young lady that I talked about in the beginning, on the very first day of school in 2003, she walked into school, her, her brand new school, right? She's a, she's a new senior, right? Nobody knows her. She doesn't know anybody. And the school that she walked into was Morrisville High School, which is about 20 minutes south of here. And it's a small school, like 250 kids. And she walked in, and the reason that I know all this about this young lady is because at the time, I was a student at Morrisville High School. And on that very first day of school, I remember it vividly. I remember when that young lady walked in the door because I, I noticed her. And so did every other male student at Morrisville High School <laughs> because she was beautiful. You know, it was, like, it was like, it's a small school, so you know everybody. You see everybody. Oh, my gosh, you see that new girl? It's like, hey, girl, want to go to Rita's afterwards, get some gelati? You know what I'm saying? But, you know, I didn't want to, like, be that weird, creepy dude who's like, hi, welcome to school. I'm Nick, you know? So I, I sat back, and I waited. I said, you know what? I mean, look at this physique. She'll come to me. So 
uh, fast forward two months later when that didn't happen, <laughs> I thought, well, I better make my move now because, you know, she's, she's cute and, and she doesn't have a boyfriend yet, so now it would be the good time. So I bought her a flower and I went up to her one morning and I said, hey, uh, I, my name's Nick and I, I bought you this flower and I gave it to her and she smiled. And then I turned around and walked away. And as I'm walking away, I'm like, you're an idiot. You didn't get her phone number or her Snapchat or her TikTok, mainly because those didn't exist back in 2003. But, but I had like no way of reconnecting with her. Thankfully, it's a small school. So at lunchtime, I was like, oh, hey, remember me? I got you the flower. You know, would you like to go out to eat somewhere on a, on a date? And she said, yeah, I would. I said, yes. So I took her to a really romantic restaurant uh, in Morrisville. It's an Italian place. Some of you might know it. It's called the Subway. And <laughs> it, was, it was super romantic because I forgot to mention that it wasn't just her and I. It was her and I and her dad. So that made it extra, extra romantic. But we hung out for a few weeks, and we sent notes back and forth. Notes are the... the, 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 the the grandfather of text messaging, right? It was like, hi, how are you? You know, you send these notes back and forth. And, and after a few weeks, I was like, well, I mean, I should lock this down. You know what I'm saying? Like, we, you know, I mean, we're, we're kind of basically dating, so let's just like make it official. So uh, we, we got together and I said, hey, you know, I like you, you like me, like let's, let's become boyfriend, girlfriend. And when I brought that up, her face just changed, the complexion in her face just changed, and she got real sullen, and she said, Nick, listen, I'm really sorry, I can't date you because you're not a Christian. Ooh, it hurt. I was like, you Christians are so judgmental, <laughs> punks. <laughs> and she said to me, but, but listen, we can still be friends, and you can still come with me to this thing called youth group at my church. And I thought, well, you'll be there, and I like you, so maybe I'll just go, and we can hang out there, and, and things will, 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 will pick up. So I came, and I came here to the crossing at this church, and we hung out down in the gym, and we played basketball, and I thought, this place is pretty cool. And then we came up here, which this was not here. It was the old chapel here, and we sat down, and... And the, 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 the worship pastor, who was Pastor Heather at the time, and her, she started singing worship, and then her husband, Eric, he was a youth pastor at the time, uh, started talking about Jesus. And uh, after the first three minutes, I was like, this is a cult. Like, what are we doing here, right? Like, they were like, they were like hey, we're going to put some words up on the screen. Let's all chant them together. I was like, well, that is cult 101, you know. <laughs> Listen, Christians are weird if you don't know what's going on. Like, we, are just, we can be weird, right? You know, it's like, let's sing this chorus 10 times over and over again until you're brainwashed, you know. <laughs> so, so we did that for a while. Listen, it's just, that's reality, right? <laughs> that's re that can be reality. And so we did that. I thought, this place is a cult, but I liked a cute girl, so I kept coming back, and I kept hanging out, and I got to know Pastor Heather. I got to know Pastor Eric. I got to know Pastor Scott. I got to know people in this building who who invested in me and cared about me. I got to know people who, who encouraged me in the church to explore my faith. I got to know more about Jesus. I got to know about a, 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 a man who died for my sins so that I could be free and so that there would be immeasurably more in my life than I could ever ask for or imagine. Nine months after that, I, I went on a mission trip and I got saved. I came to know Jesus. And I think about that, and that all happened because our God is a God of reconciliation. And because God called members of this church to go out and to impact the world, God called members of this church to be ones who were igniting hearts, changing lives, and impacting the world for Jesus because of this church. I am who I am today. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And, and men and women, the good news for you and I, 20 years later, is that God wants to use us and do it over and over again. He wants to use us, imperfect, sinful men and women who've been blood-bought, who are redeemed by the name of Jesus Christ. He wants to use us to go out into the world, into our neighborhoods, into our schools, into our communities. He wants to use us to change the world, and we all get to do that together. Listen, how many of us were in the pits of despair how many of us were feeling like we were going to hell and we were, we were falling apart? 
but we were rescued by Jesus Christ. Maybe we were brought into this church. We were brought into this place where it was a place of impacting the world. How many of us had our lives changed because of this place and because of the call to ignite hearts, change lives, and impact the world? And here we are, right here, right now, in 2022. You're here on Labor Day weekend. You could have been at the beach, but you're here, right here, right now, because God is calling us to be a place and a people that go out and impact the world for Jesus to join together all of our gifts to come together, not for, not for personal gain, not for personal glory, not for, hey, look at me, look what I did, but to say, look at who our Jesus is. We get to come together, we get to do that. Listen, I want you to think for a second. Think about the families in your life, the family members in your life that don't know Jesus. Think about your neighbors who don't know Jesus. Think about your folks, your coworkers, students. Think about your classmates who you're going to sit with over the course of the next week as you go back to school who don't know Jesus and who are walking through anxiety and depression and they don't have any idea about their identity. We have an opportunity to go out into the world and to make disciples for Jesus Christ and to share the love and the power of our God. Amen. Isn't that, isn't that good news? Because 100%. 100% of me, 100% of one of you is nothing compared to 1% of all of us together, working together. And we're able to impact the world not because we're smart, not because we have education, not because we're gifted or we're talented. We get to impact the world because Christ uses us and fills us with Holy Spirit. And we get to go and we get to speak and we get to share the gospel and we get to love others. And the promise is, men and women, he is Emmanuel. He is with us always day after day after day. Now, practically, what does this mean? What does it look like? Listen, I never, you know, we never want to guilt trip anybody. You must serve, you know? We never want to like twist your arm and say you must serve. But let me just say this. This is the impression that I got this week. And I don't know if it's from the Lord or if it was the bad pizza I had last week. I don't know. The indigestion, right? Satan loves it when all we do is come to church for an hour and 15 minutes on Sunday and then go home and think nothing about our faith for the rest of the week. He loves it. He loves it when we're too busy to live out our faith. He loves it when we're too tied up. Oh, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll serve this way or I'll share my faith later on, I just don't have time. He loves it when all we do is just come here and then go home. And I'm not telling you to get involved and do something every single night of the week. I'm not telling you you have to sacrifice family time. I'm not saying any of that. But what I'm, what I'm asking you to do is to pray about your sphere of influence. What is your sphere of influence and where can you step into that sphere? Practically here at the church, we've got so many ministries that are all about impacting the world. Our, our kids' ministries and our, our youth ministries. Listen, our hearts, the, the kids' ministries and the youth ministries, we pray. And you can pray with us, you can join with us. We pray to be able to go into the public schools and to be able to impact the public schools. We're praying for ways to make that happen. Programs start up again on Wednesday the 14th. Our men's and our women's ministries, we've got events lined up for this next year that are coming up designed to not only help us grow, but to help men and women who don't know Jesus come to know him for the first time. You can talk to uh, Esther's outside for the next women's event afterwards. If you go on our website, you can find all the different local ministries that we've partnered with over the past few years. And listen, in a couple weekends, we're gonna spend a few weekends talking about all, all of our missionaries. They're, they're, we're gonna talk about them after the service. You're gonna hear about the mission trips that we have coming up because maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, you know what, Nick, I am called to go to the far off places of the world. God's been welling it up inside of me. What, what, are, the, what are the options that we have here to be a part of that? And so as we close today, Listen, I, I, I just, I just want to say this. The, the, the takeaway is, is to be praying about your sphere of influence. Where has God called you? Because it's, it's an imperative from Jesus to go and make disciples. The location is specific to each one of us, but the imperative is for all of us because we all have an opportunity to impact the world for him. So I want to invite you to stand now as we close. We are a church that for, the, for decades now, we've been igniting hearts, changing lives, and impacting the world for Jesus. And you and I, we all get to be a part of that. We all get to do it together. So here's what I wanna do. 
If you're in a place where you feel like God is calling you to go somewhere, maybe it's a far off place or a mission trip, or maybe it's, it's, it's a workplace, maybe you have to talk to somebody in your family, I wanna invite you right now to take a step of faith and come forward to the front, okay? Now, we're gonna work on it. You, if you feel like God is calling you, there's a family member in your life, there's somebody in your school that you need to talk to, there's somebody that, 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 that in your neighborhood or your community, like, hey, God's really calling me to chat with them, or maybe it's in your workplace where you want to be bold. And you say, I, I need prayer for that. I wanna invite you to come forward right now so that we can pray for you. Is there anybody in the room who needs boldness for the call that God has on their life? Come on, come forward. If you need boldness for the call that God has for your life, I wanna invite you to come forward. Because just like God commissioned Abraham and Isaiah in the Old Testament, just like Jesus commissioned the 11 disciples on this mountain in Galilee, now is the time that we can go out and impact our families and impact our communities. So I'm gonna pray real quickly over these folks and then I wanna invite prayer team, you come up, we'll pray over everybody here today. And if you have any other prayer needs, you're welcome to come forward. But hey, would you all raise your hands out towards these folks right here as we pray boldness over them. So Father God, come, Lord, and fill this group up with your boldness, Lord. Fill this group up with your power. God, I pray for the family, members that need to be talked to, Lord. I pray for the neighbors and the community members. God, I pray for folks right here, right now, who are, who are wrestling with a call to go to the far off places of the earth, Lord. Woo. Lord, fill them with boldness, God, and give them clarity about your next steps. Give them clarity about who you are, God. Come and fill them in Jesus' name. Church, let's continue to worship. You're welcome to come forward for prayer. Prayer team, if you're here, if you could come down and we can pray blessing and commissioning over these folks, I'd love your help with that. Let's, let's worship.